Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the MAPS talk, our last MAPS talk of the semester, actually. So I appreciate everyone who is coming live to the presentation. Remember, the advantage to coming live is that you can type your questions into the chat while the talk is going on, and we will ask Dr. Elliott these questions at the end. So um, be on the lookout on the MAPS website for the fall when we start up again. We are planning to go live. And also another thing that you can find on the MAPS website at MJC is the, uh, the past talks from this whole past year. We do have a link to the Great Valley Museum YouTube page where you can see some of our archive talks, not only from this year, but from previous years as well. So you can hold yourself uh, make yourself last through the summer watching some of our past talks and then join us again in the fall. Um, also, speaking of the Great Valley Museum, I just wanted to point out that in honor of Earth Day, the Great Valley Museum has free admission tomorrow. Um, and also tomorrow is the last day of our uh, traveling exhibit, the Sayaka Gans Reclaim Creations exhibit. And it is a great exhibit to check out for Earth Day. So if you haven't seen it, Try to get there tomorrow, it's the last day. And so I'd like to introduce our own Professor Debbie Bolter, Professor of Anthropology at MJC, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Marina Elliott this evening for her talk, Homo Naledi and the Rising Star Cave. Dr. Elliott was the lead excavator, researcher, and exploration science and field coordinator for the Rising Star Hominin site for the Evolutionary Studies Institute at Wits, Wits University in Johannesburg, South Africa for five years. She holds the Distinguished National Geographic Explorer title. Marina is co-author of the book titled A Handbook to the Cradle of Humankind. She has multiple publications and research journals, including Paleoanthropology, PLOS One, Journal of Human Evolution, Chemical Geology, and eLife. She is currently busy teaching human osteology for the University of Calgary and the archeology span of death and burial at Mount Royal University in Canada. But tonight we have her here with us in Modesto. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marina Elliott. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bolter for that lovely welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, some of you uh, probably have heard about Homo Naledi and the Rising Star Cave um, back when it was discovered in 2013. But you know, it's been a little while and a lot has happened since the discovery. So tonight, I'm going to actually give you a little recap of how I got involved in the project and what we've learned so far about this fascinating new member of the human family. So just to orient everyone a little bit, there is an area in South Africa known as the Cradle of Humankind. It's about 70 kilometers outside of Johannesburg, and it has been famous for hominin fossil sites like Sturklantain and Swartkrans since the early 1930s. And it was made a World Heritage Site in 1999 because of the remarkable discoveries made in the area. Uh, many of the fossil sites in the cradle and around South Africa, in fact, are associated with caves. Although most of the material in the past was collected from surface rubble blasted out by things like mining operations. And probably one of the most famous of these is one called the Taung Child. And this is a four to seven year old juvenile that was discovered in a limestone quarry in Western South Africa and was identified as an early hominin called Australopithecus africanus by Raymond Dart in 1924. And for a number of reasons that we can talk about later, this one fossil almost single-handedly kicked off the discipline of paleoanthropology and really changed the way we look at human evolution altogether. Homo Naledi's story, though, started a bit more recently in 2013, when two sport cavers, Rick Hunter and Steve Tucker, entered a cave system called Rising Star, located just on the edge of the cradle. The pair had actually been recruited by Professor Lee Berger, an American paleoanthropologist who has been working in South Africa for many years and who was responsible for discovering another new hominin fossil, Australopithecus sediba, in 2008. Having found sediba, Lee thought that there might be even more fossils to be found underground. 
But as he jokes himself, he was no longer sort of physiologically appropriate for caving. So he asked the guys to look out for bones during their recreational caving outings. Rising Star is actually a well-known recreational caving area and hundreds of cavers have trained in its passages over the years. And many of the routes had been mapped as early as the 1980s. On the night in question though, Rick and Steve were exploring an area off the map and they ended up in a small slot in the rock. They then discovered that it continued down 12 meters to be exact and led into a series of smaller chambers. In the second chamber, they found something really interesting, a scattering of bones on the floor, some of which looked very, very human-like. So they took these photos to Dr. Berger to see if they were the kind of thing that he was looking for. And Lee immediately recognized them as potentially important. But the cavers said that the route was very difficult to get to and Lee would probably never get there himself. So he had to figure out how he was going to get the fossils out of the cave. So he did what any good researcher would do, and he put an ad on Facebook. I didn't actually see this ad, but I was finishing my PhD in biological anthropology at the time at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, and my supervisor sent me this post. And as you can see, the requirements were pretty specific and a little unusual, and it all sounded a bit mysterious and a bit crazy and slightly dangerous, so naturally I was in. Uh, and one of the reasons that I was so keen was that I'd grown up in Alberta, hiking and climbing and caving for fun. So I figured I had the necessary physical skills to get into the cave. I also had the academic skills from my degrees. And in fact, I had already excavated in some pretty extreme environments. First in Siberia with a 5,000 year old hunter gatherer mortuary site. And then in Alaska, where we excavated under armed guards, not for the dangerous people, but actually for the polar bears. So I really thought that I had a pretty good shot, but as it turned out, almost 60 other people thought they did too. But in the end, six of us were chosen, four Americans, one Australian and me. Within a month though, we were all in South Africa, setting up a 60 person camp enlisting the help of numerous volunteer cavers and dozens of scientists, running kilometers of power and communication cables through the cave, setting up multiple cameras throughout the cave to monitor safety and constructing a command center and a science tent to process the fossils if we got them out. This was all a major operation whose sole purpose was to recover these bones from, from this remote chamber underground. And by remote, I mean really hard to get to. So the fossil chamber itself is about 200 meters from the nearest outside entrance and 25 meters below the surface. To get there though, you have to travel through a couple of narrow hallways and down a vertical shaft that's about four meters high where we have a ladder now. And then the first really tight section is something called the Superman crawl. And this is a narrow tunnel that you have to sort of lie on your belly and it's only about 40 centimeters high. So there's not enough room to get up on your elbows and your knees. So you literally just lie on your stomach and kind of push with your toes for the couple of meters that it takes to get through that. From there, you enter another area called the dragon's back chamber. And this leads to what's called the dragon's back, which is actually a large block of a rock that had fallen many, many years ago. And to get up and over it, you have to go onto a knife ridge. Uh, it's only about 25 centimeters wide with a six foot drop on one side and, and an eight meter drop on the other. So uh, when we were there in, in 2013, we actually wore harnesses and roped up this dragon's back. And then it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, from there, we enter another tunnel that sits above an area called the chute. And this is that narrow crack that Rick and Steve uh, stumbled upon uh, first. And this chute is, is about a 12 meter high vertical slot in the rock with a couple of pinch points, one of which is about 18 centimeters wide. And you have to climb down this slot feet first kind of feeling for your footholds and handholds because you don't actually have enough room to, to bend your head and look down. Um, and then at the bottom of this chute, you drop into another little chamber that we called the landing zone. And then another little short hallway that leads into the fossil chamber itself, now called the Dinaletti chamber. So all told, um, that's not a very easy commute, but I was the first scientist to get into the chamber. And at the time, 
we really thought we were all going in to recover maybe a single skeleton, probably of a known hominin like Australopithecus africanus, something that we were already familiar with. But when I actually got down there and shone my headlamp into the chamber floor, I realized that we were actually dealing with something quite different. I could see some of the bones that Rick and Steve had taken photos of in the beginning, but there was also a lot more material on the surface than we'd actually expected. So our first task was to mark everything on the surface so that we could actually move around in the space, which is quite confined. And every fossil or fragment was flagged, photographed, tagged, bagged, and then transported to the surface in plastic containers and dry bags. And do in doing this, we recovered over 300 fragments. Then we actually got down to the task of excavating. We usually worked in pairs because there's not, there weren't enough room really for more than two or three people at a time. And we worked from five to seven hours a day underground. The excavation itself, uh, the excavation area itself is quite small and there's an overhang of rock just above it. So we basically worked on our hands and knees the whole time. And the cave itself uh, maintains a pretty constant temperature of about 18 degrees Celsius, but it stays at about 99% humidity. So the work can, was a little bit sticky sometimes. And unlike most other hominin sites in South Africa, the fossil material is not encased in, in a hard sort of breccia like a concrete, but it was in soft clay sediments. So we used standard archeological excavation techniques so mostly toothpicks, tiny paintbrushes, and plastic spoons to collect everything. And the tight spaces actually prevented us from bringing in and using any normal survey equipment. So for spatial documentation, we used an Arctic white light 3D scanner in addition to regular photographs and hand drawings. Then once all the material was brought to the surface, we put it into the science tent and it was cleaned, identified, documented, and then repacked and sorted and stored in safes uh, on site. The joke around the camp after the first couple of days was that, you know, we're, we're gonna need another safe because we just really quickly ran out of room. But we then did an, a second round of excavations in March, 2014 with a smaller crew and only two excavators, Becca Pashoto and myself. And so we just, we like to call ourselves the skeleton crew, but we went back and did another round of just a couple of weeks of excavation because we hadn't managed to get everything that we wanted out uh, in the first round in 2013. But uh, the process of getting in and out of the cave, as you can see, was a little bit rough on the body, but I think we all really felt it was worth it because after those two short expeditions, we had recovered almost 1600 fossil specimens. And that's the largest single assemblage of fossils in Africa and almost more than any other excavation in history. So this photo that you see here represents about a third of the material that we recovered from the Dinaletti chamber. So it really is a, a treasure trove of material, but of course, getting the bones out of the cave was just the beginning. The next task was to analyze this fantastic load of material. And in May 2014, I returned again to South Africa to join the analysis and description teams. In total, there were almost 40 scientists involved from all over the world, one of which actually was your very own Dr. Bolter. And we dedicated more than 10,000 man hours to figuring out what we were dealing with. And that in itself was actually quite surprising. First, the preservation of the material was was truly excellent. As you can see here from these two partial skulls that we recovered and reconstructed. So you can even see that the dentition looks very, very um, almost perfect. And the demographic profile was really, really interesting. In that first assemblage, we had 15 individuals of both males and females ranging in age from neonates to older adults. And we're now up to, I think, 23 individuals in the Dinaletti chamber. So again, very, very uncommon. And we had some very complete material like this beautiful foot that we have one of five. So this is just one of five that we have partial remains for. And this almost complete hand that Becca and I excavated in 2014 and we found it fully articulated. So when we excavated out of the sediments, we actually found 
it with its little fingertips curled over the palm like this, and it was only missing one small bone in the wrist. And we actually have parts of seven other hands in the assemblage. So really, truly remarkable stuff. And we also recovered some extremely rare elements, like these tiny ear ossicles that were sifted out of the back dirt. And prior to Rising Star, only two other such bones existed in the early hominin fossil record, and now there's four more. So really remarkable. And because we have almost every element represented multiple times, we have a pretty good idea of what Homo naledi looked like. And overall, naledi shows a surprising mixture of features, a brain about a third the size of a modern human, but with a rounded skull like other members of, of our own genus, Homo, and internal morphology that suggests a more complex brain. It has quite small teeth like modern humans, but with some sort of ancestral traits in its shape. Its shoulders and, and upper arms are, are very ape-like, but the lower arms are more modern looking. The wrist and the hands are really modern looking, but then the fingers are extremely curved, almost more so than any other early hominin to date. And then the trunk and pelvis also look a bit more ancestral, but the lower legs are long and slim with feet that are almost indistinguishable from modern humans. And it's pretty small in body size, averaging about 40 kilos and standing around 140 centimeters tall. And interestingly, some of Naledi's features appear to be entirely unique to it. In particular, the shape of the thumb and some aspects of the spine and upper leg. So it seems as though Naledi might have been doing something different from other hominin species in terms of its grip and its locomotor behavior. And because we have so many individuals and so many parts represented multiple times, it was pretty easy to establish that these unusual features were not the result of a disease or an injury or something like that. And from the combination of features, we were pretty confident, confident about designating a new species. But as if all of that wasn't interesting enough, the physical context of the material was unusual. First, that of those uh, early specimens that we recovered in 2013, over a thousand of them came out of an excavation unit, 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters by just 20 centimeters deep. That's smaller than the average child's sandbox. So you can imagine just the concentration and density of material from that one area. Then with the exception of a few modern bird bones and a handful of isolated rodent remains, there were no other large vertebrate species found in the chamber with all those hominin remains. That's very, very unusual. Nor was there any evidence for occupation within the site or anywhere within the rising star system, either past or present. So no evidence of fire, no evidence of tools, nothing like that. There was also no evidence of carnivore or scavenging activity on any of the bones. We had a little bit of, of insect damage on the bones, but we have nothing to indicate that, that a large predator or even a scavenger was, was bringing those bones into the system. And we know that the material couldn't have fallen in from above because there's actually a layer of rock called a capping chert above the chamber that is unbroken. And in South Africa, a lot of fossil, fossil hominin remains are accumulate through what are called sinkholes or death traps. And that wasn't the case in this example. Now, the current access route might have changed somewhat over time, but we do know that the Dinaledi chamber itself hasn't changed very much from that dragon's back um, area forward. And it was sufficiently restricted to prevent access by any other animals after the Naledi material entered the system. We also know that the material wasn't washed in by something like a river or a flash flood. And this actually comes from some of the geological evidence in the sediments, as well as the presence of that beautifully articulated hand. Because if there had been any, any fluvial movement at all, any water movement, all those tiny little bones would have been moved or lost. So we know that that hand not only went in, most likely with soft tissue still attached, but that it hadn't been disturbed from when it de was deposited to when we actually found it. We also know from the position of the bones that the material didn't enter the chamber all at once in some kind of catastrophe, but it actually accumulated over a period of time. And part of that again comes from that beautifully articulated hand, but it was sitting right beside a femur fragment that had to have been defleshed 
and already in place when that hand went in with the soft tissue on it. So again, um, there's all these little pieces of evidence that we can use. So without other options though, we basically ran out of ways to explain how all these individuals ended up together in this remote area with no other animals. And it left us with the only reasonable explanation that fit all the evidence. And that was that Homo naledi may have been deliberately disposing of its dead in this chamber. Now that might seem a, a difficult conclusion to accept, but it's the only one that made sense given the evidence that we had. But a single example is just a phenomenon. To be truly convincing, it helps to find another example that then can start to show you a pattern. And at the end of 2013, we found just that, a second locality of Homo naledi remains in the Rising Star Cave. It's called the Lissetti Chamber, and it's separated from the Dinaledi Chamber by more than 140 meters of tunnel. And in fact, in order to get to the Lissetti Chamber from the Dinaledi Chamber, you basically have to go all the way back to the entrance and then hang a left and go back down towards the Lissetti Chamber. And at the end of 2014, I actually moved to South Africa to work full time on the Homonaledi material. And my first task was to excavate this, this material from the new Lissetti Chamber. Now, the access to Lissetti is a tiny bit easier than getting to Dinaledi, but if you can believe it, the working space is even smaller. So there's only room for one excavator, and I mostly worked kind of, as you can see in the top left there, hunched over this pinnacle of rock with kind of dolomite walls on either side of me. So um, yeah, not the easiest excavation uh, techniques, but we got it done. And again, the effort was super worth it because we recovered parts of at least three more Homo naledi individuals, including this almost complete uh, large adult male, which we nicknamed Neo which means gift in Sesotho, one of the 11 official languages in South Africa. And really, again, the preservation was, was quite extraordinary. At the same time though, we were working very hard to date the material from the Dinaledi chamber to try and figure out where this species fit into the human timeline. But, and as I mentioned, that ancestral looking anatomy had originally suggested to some researchers that Homo naledi might be a million or even more years old. But after multiple analyses using double blind labs and a whole bunch of different techniques, we actually discovered that the bones were surprisingly young. So 335 to 241,000 years ago. And in fact, just a couple of months ago, we published a refinement of these dates, narrowing down the period in which the remains were deposited even further. So then our question became how to explain this, this mismatch between the you know, sort of presumably archaic or primitive anatomy and these very young dates. Well, we actually know from other examples in the animal kingdom that taxa can remain unchanged for many millennia with modern populations looking almost identical to their ancient ancestors. So maybe it's some kind of similar sort of stabilizing selection that was operating with Homo naledi. And in fact, we have other examples already within the Homo genus in the form of a species called Homo floresiensis, which you may have heard of. And this comes from Indonesia. And it's another species with a kind of strange combination of archaic and modern traits. And although it was originally thought to be as young as 17,000 years, um, it's recently been redated to more like 100 to 60,000 years, but that's still very, very uh, recent given the kind of anatomy that it's got. And we've also got another more recently announced potential species from the Philippines called Homo luzonensis that also seems to show this combination of archaic looking anatomy, but existing into relatively recent times. Now, unfortunately, there isn't much material attributed to Homo luzonensis yet, so we'll have to wait for more evidence before we can say much more on that one. But collectively, these species are starting to show us a different pattern to human evolution than that kind of straight line that it's sometimes visualized to be. And there might be a lot more nuance and, and interesting stuff going on than we previously assumed. But Naledi's dates were also surprising because we know from other sites in Africa that anatomically modern humans like us were around at the same time and may even have been in the same area as Homo naledi which means it's conceivable that Homo naledi and modern humans might have interacted. 
Now, we don't know what those interactions may have looked like, but it's an intriguing set of questions, particularly since we already know from DNA that modern human groups share a variable amount of ancestry with other groups like Neanderthals, Denisovans, and at least two other ghost groups that are only known from DNA and not, not from skeletal remains. So it's the potential is there. Naturally, the recent dates also raised questions about the South African archeological record. Now, there isn't a ton of skeletal material associated with the early Middle Stone Age in South Africa. So it's kind of hard to say who made the stone tools that are found. So it's possible it could have been no homo naledi. And this might seem surprising again, but it's actually not far off the situation in East Africa, where we already know that there are multiple hominin species on the landscape at the same time, and there's no sort of smoking gun to say which one was making the tools. And for me, these kinds of discoveries make the science much more interesting. And after all we've learned so far, we've got so many questions still outstanding. And one of the big ones for Homo naledi was whether or not that concentration and density of material that we found in 2013 was consistent across the chamber floor. And in fact, uh, when we published the first description of the site, the floor of the chamber was kind of depicted as this consistent bone bed with the fossils that we collected being just one small sample of what was there. But as it turns out, this wasn't quite right. In 2017 and 2018, we went back into the Dinaletti chamber with the specific goal of determining the extent of the fossil material in the chamber. We actually decided to start right below that 12 meter high chute where we thought the bodies might have been coming in. Since it was the highest point of the sediments in the chamber, we hypothesized that if the bones had fallen in or were even being dumped down this fissure instead of being brought all the way in, that there might be material directly below the chute. And then we would find that it had kind of trickled down into the Dinaletti chamber proper. But what we actually found was a mass of skeletal material right at the top of the sediments and another smaller group of bones at the bottom of the slope and almost nothing in between. And what was really cool about the material at the top of the slope was that some of it seemed to be articulated, that is in the position that it would have been in life. So there were even some tiny teeth peeking at, out at us on the surface. And this really made us stop and try and think about how best to get this material out while also preserving the important position and orientation of the bones that we thought were articulated. In the end though, we actually went old school and encased the material in plaster the way paleontologists do to remove dinosaur bones. Unfortunately, the whole mass was too big to get up that narrow chute, so we had to divide it into three sections. And these three sections we affectionately called blob one, blob two, and blob three. Uh, blob one and two were pretty small, but blob three, which held what we thought was that really critical articulated material, was well over 60 centimeters long and weighed an uncomfortable 24 kilograms. So really just at the absolute edge of what we thought we could get out. And by the time we put padding and a caving bag around it, we weren't sure we would get it out the chute at all. But six cavers, two pulleys and two and a half hours later, remember we're only going about 200 meters. So two and a half hours later, we managed to get it out of the cave safely. And since they were so nicely protected in that plaster, we actually didn't want to open the jackets right away. So instead we CT scanned them to look at the contents inside. And here you can see this, the CT images on the right and the original plaster jacketed blobs on the left. Not surprisingly, blob three turned out to be the most interesting one. And that those tantalizing teeth that we'd seen on the surface actually turned out to be a whole set of teeth most of which were in their proper position, and it appears to be a juvenile. So that is super exciting. And at the moment, the plan is to leave the blobs intact and try to virtually excavate the material inside by using computer software instead of trying to break open the blobs. But again, that's gonna take a little bit of time, so we're still waiting on that one. At the same time, our exploration team was actually working their way into some of the really remote and tiny fissures around the Dinaletti chamber, looking for alternate routes in or more fossil material, whatever we could find. And as you can see, 
Some of these fissures were extremely small uh, and they actually, this earned them some nicknames that we can't actually include in any of the pop in the publications, but they, you know, really, really difficult places to get into. But just a couple of months ago, we published two new papers describing some skeletal material that we recovered from one of these nasty little locations. It's affectionately known as pandemonium, but it's officially known as UW110 or 110. And the material here consists of some fragmented cranial material and teeth of a four to six year old Homo naledi child. And that location is about 10 meters away from where the main Dinaledi assemblage was recovered. And it's also in one of these very confined and awkward passages. So again, a really, really exciting discovery and to have um, more infant remains is, is really wonderful. So now in total, we have almost 30 individuals recovered from at least three different localities in the cave system from areas that share similarities in terms of their depositional environment and in their context, and in the fact that they all contain just this single species of hominin. And eight years, or almost nine years now later, we still don't have a better hypothesis than the one of deliberate disposal. So all of this is pretty interesting and sometimes challenging to fit in with what we know about the origins of humanity, but it reinforces that we actually still have a lot to learn and that there's probably more going on in places like Southern Africa than we ever imagined. And for people like me, that's hugely exciting. And it proves that our family tree is a lot bushier and more complex than we thought. And so instead of a tree, it might actually be better to imagine our family as a river delta with multiple streams kind of flowing down from a common source. Some of them might divert and dry up, um, becoming extinct, or sometimes they might rejoin other streams like the Neanderthals to finally make their way down to that big pool at the end. And of course, that big pool at the end is the 7 billion humans that we've got on this planet today in all our beautiful variety. And then for me personally, this discovery also emphasizes that exploration is not dead. I was definitely one of those kids that kind of loved reading about daring explorers and explorations, but I kind of thought that that glorious golden age of, of exploration was, was over and past and there wasn't really much else to find. But that's so not true. Homo naledi was discovered in a well-known cave in an area that was already famous for its fossils. So there's no reason to think that there aren't more amazing things to find, maybe even in our own backyards. And on that note, when I returned to Canada in 2020, I started thinking about what amazing discoveries might still be waiting for us on this continent. And we actually think we know a lot about the prehistory of North America, but if Homo naledi has taught me anything, it's that there's always more to discover. So one of the other things that I've been working on since I came back to Canada is applying my experiences in the South African context to North America by revisiting the evidence for human activity in caves on this continent, compiling what we know, what we don't know, and finding ways to apply new technology to the questions of sort of how and when human came, humans came to dominate this part of the planet. And to do this, I've actually teamed up with some colleagues at Simon Fraser University, my old alma mater, and we've applied for some grants to build a database and do some field work in the caves of Western Canada. And in fact, we've already been pretty successful. So our database has information now on more than 850 cave sites in Western Canada and Alaska. So Alberta, BC, the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. And then we tacked on Alaska because that's kind of the, the entrance from Beringia. And so we've already found information on 850 caves. Uh, and that's, that's super exciting. But then to make it even more exciting, we've actually already identified a cave with previously unknown or undescribed cave art in it. So this site, which we're obviously not sharing the name or location of just yet for obvious reasons, was found by a local caver, you know, shades of, of rising star, um, who then alerted, it, alerted me to it. And so my colleague Mark Collard and I had a chance to visit the site last year with the cavers who discovered it. And it really is pretty cool stuff. It looks like some pretty authentic pictographs. 
And so we're now in the process of applying for permissions to do the research and we're consulting with local First Nations on how they'd like to be involved. So it really is pretty, pretty awesome stuff. But overall, the reason that I think projects like Rising Star and this new cave project are so important is that really they help us understand kind of who we are as humans. And, you know, most people will know that, you know, you're, you're always interested in, in your family history. Um, everybody likes to know sort of where they, where they came from and why they are the way they are. And so projects like these are, are really about tracing our family history in deep time and across the whole globe. And in doing so, it really gives us an opportunity to kind of reflect on what it means to be human, what, it, what we share as a species, and what we want our future to look like. And, you know, perhaps in these trying times, um, it might not be so bad to focus a bit more on, on the, our commonalities rather than on our differences. And we really have so much more to learn about our collective past. And I, I truly think it's an excellent time to be involved in the process. So, you know, if you are an anthropologist, that's awesome, or a budding anthropologist. Um, but even if you're just a, a regular person um, doing what you do out in the world, this really is about, about what we all share. And I think it's, it's worth being engaged in that conversation and learning about it and, and taking an active um, role in just in finding out about what it is that we've, we've got in common. And, and there's just so much more to do. So I think actually with that, I will let, I will be done and I'm totally happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much for that uh, fascinating presentation. It seems like quite an adventure. So um, I just wanted to encourage people to put questions in the chat. We have a couple to start us off with. One of the early ones was uh, exactly what you started leading to. They wondered whether the chambers were larger originally or were the bodies taken there on purpose after death. And I was wondering, like maybe both of those could be true because it seems like they must have been a little bit easier to get to. Well, um, yeah, there's there's a couple of points in there. Um, we do know that um, basically past that chute area that I described, um, the, the Dinaletti chamber itself and the Lucetti chamber have not actually changed that much. So getting from the entrance of the system to the dragon's back might have been a little easier at, at some point in the distant past, but basically from there on, we know that it hasn't changed. And in fact, 300,000 years isn't a tremendous amount of time geologically for, for anything to change. So at a certain point, they still had to be going at least some of the way that, that we went. But bear in mind also that they're quite a bit smaller than, than we are. So, you know, sort of overall about two thirds the size of, of me and I'm not a very big human, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's entirely possible that it was not as difficult for them as it is for us, especially with dragging backpacks and stuff. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, and the, the geology though appears to have been pretty stable, um, at least for the last three, 350,000 years from the dragon's back towards the Dinaletti chamber. But great question, yeah. Well, a similar uh, question was uh, if there's any speculation as to the light source that must have been used when they were trying to get in there. Is there any kind of scorch marks that you can find? I don't know if that would yeah. still be available. Fantastic question. We actually looked very hard for any traces of, of fire um, at all in the chamber, and, and we've done a lot of work on that. We don't have anything um, to indicate that they were using a light source or fire at all. But one of the things that I was working on just before I left South Africa um, was that we were doing quite a lot of research on looking at modern baboons who use caves in South Africa. And there's a couple of populations in the southern part of South Africa, in the Cape region, and also in the Cradle of Humankind. And we have some video footage and some camera traps, um, camera trap images that actually show that baboons go into caves on a pretty regular basis, but they're not just using the, the sort of the gloaming area. They're actually going fully into the dark zone. They're going, you know, 150, 200 meters into the dark zone 
on a pretty regular basis and coming back out again and continuing on with their daily activities. And we have some, uh, it's actually from the BBC many years ago, did took some footage of um, a female baboon working her way through one of these passages. There is no light. She's, she's simply moving through this system by feel and by scent. And she has a young infant beside her who's sort of keeping one hand on her flank as they move through. And as they get sort of onto one of these ledges, the infant missteps and falls off uh, one of these ledges and ends up, you know, just maybe a meter or so away from his mother. And there's, you know, some, as you can imagine, some bawling and some carrying on, but he, he gets back um, in touch with his mother and they continue on. So I think for me, the more interesting question is not necessarily whether they had to have fire, but what, you know, how they were moving through these systems. And I think our, our modern brains immediately assume that they had to have had more light than, you know, than we would be comfortable going into a cave with. Um, but I think there's a lot of species that simply don't, don't need the kind of, the kind of obsessive light that, that humans are used to. So, um, you know, back in the past, you, you might've just moved through those systems in a different way. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, whether there were any cave paintings or art found in this rising star cave system. And then another question, whether there were any clothes, clothing found. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, no paintings, um, no pictographs, petroglyphs, any of that kind of stuff. Um, and again, we've, you know, both myself and my explorers have been in that cave. Um, pretty exhaustively. And so um, it would be it would be very strange for there to be pictographs or, or petroglyphs in that area, generally speaking, but also in that time period. Um, parietal art or cave art doesn't happen um, among humans until much later. So that would have been really revolutionary if we'd found um, anything like that in the cave. Um, but we don't even have any evidence of, of later paintings in that same space. So Either later humans were not were not using those spaces um, after that period, or they just weren't doing those kinds of, of pictographs or paintings. And they're they're not super common in South Africa, generally speaking. Um, so uh, painting. And then the second question was about clothing. Uh, also, no clothing um, that we've found per se. Um, again, that would be pretty pretty unusual, both for the time period and for something that that we basically assume is, is not human. Um, so this is a species that, although similar to us in many respects, um, is definitely, you would recognize them as, as not human. And I think if they got on, on, the, on the bus with you, you would get off pretty quickly. So um, yeah, not human. Well, maybe along those same lines, there's a question about how can you tell what the Homo naledi looked like from these fossil fossils? Yeah, so the, the depiction, the reconstruction that you've got on your screen at the moment is by um, a very talented uh, paleo reconstruction artist named John Gurchy. Um, he's, he's fantastic, but there's, there's a lot of what we call sort of paleo poetry to reconstruction as well. So um, what we do know from the skeleton are the, you know, is sort of the bone structure. What we then do with that in terms of the soft tissue and hair, that kind of thing, is, is sort of an educated guess, I guess, if you were. Um, so we can make some uh, educated assumptions about skin color, given the climate and the, the period, probably darker hair, dark eyes, those um, quite tantalizing mutton chops that this particular individual has on the screen. Mm, maybe, maybe not. Um, but we do have at least the, the basic bone structure and we can tell things like um, their, their limb proportions. And that was something that was really important about the individual from the Lissetti chamber, the individual named, uh, nicknamed Neo, is that because he was sort of by himself, whereas the other material from the Dinaletti chamber was quite commingled, but because Neo was kind of by himself, we had a really good idea of what sort of an individual blueprint looked like. So we were able to reconstruct what, what a single individual looked like with, with, I think, pretty reasonable accuracy. But the soft tissue is always difficult. Okay. Um, there's another question whether 
you think it's a sign of respect or affection that these bodies were placed so far inside a cave? Oh, that's, that's the ultimate question, right? I mean, intent is, is not uh, preserved in the fossil record, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, we can't say. Um, there's lots and lots of speculation. I tend not to use the word burial when talking about this particular deposit. I use the word deliberate disposal. And there's a lot of discussion around, you know, how you make, you know, how you define certain behaviors in terms of, of what we call mortuary archaeology or, um, you know, just looking at the way both humans and non-human species interact with and treat the dead. Um, and whether you, you want to interpret that in some religious way or in some spiritual way, we can't tell that from, from the fossil record. Um, and whether it was ill intent or, or in veneration, again, it's, it's impossible to say. But they went to a lot of effort is all that we can say. Well, another uh, question that might have to do with speculation, is there any way to guess uh, how big their population size was from the evidence that you've been excavating? Oh, that's a fantastic question. No, we don't, we don't know yet. I mean, now that we're up to sort of 20, 25, almost 30 individuals in the three different locations, um, you know, we need, we need a little bit better refinement in terms of the amount of time that we're dealing with um, among those individuals. So we haven't yet dated the Lissetti chamber, for example. Um, we don't know whether the, the new UW-110 individual is temporarily um, the same as the Dinaletti individuals. You know, we can make some, some speculation about that, but we need to do some more, some more actual science in order to figure that out. And so population size is, is really difficult to get at. It's also quite um, interesting that in an area that is so rich in fossils already and that so many other cave sites are known that we don't have any other evidence of Homo naledi except in this one cave system. And it's, you know, it's definitely possible that that will change if we continue to explore other caves in the area um, and in fact, possibly revisit some of the, the material that has been excavated already that might be too fragmentary to have been recognized previously. So um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to know how big the population size was originally, but we might get at that one day. Well, another question that might tie into that is whether there are genetic markers that are unique to Homo naledi when you're discovering these to try to assign these remains to the different categories? Sure, yep, that's a, a good question too. We've tried uh, several times now to get DNA out of, out of the remains of Homo naledi. It's really difficult, as I said, that, that very humid, very warm environment in the cave is super destructive to DNA, so it, it doesn't preserve well. And we've tried several times and you know, not had any success so far. But that doesn't mean that we might not have success later on or that there might not be new technologies that come along later that we can then revisit material and, and actually get, you know, have some success with it. So we'll keep trying, I think. Um, but so far we have, we have no DNA evidence yet. And maybe, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But um, the environment is, is pretty rough on DNA. So right now this is based on the specific characteristics of the bone, certain features of the bone structure? Yes, yeah, yeah. And that, that's that been standard um, sort of paleoanthropology and biology um, generally is that you look at the, the skeletal morphology, you look at the anatomy, you look at features that might, you know, that appear to be, um, you know, derived and some that are ancestral, so some that are unique, some that appear to be um, shared with other species and you kind of make make family trees from, from that. So yeah, most of, most of our, our hypotheses right now about where Homo naledi fits in um, is all from the skeletal material. Mm. Okay, then we have another question. Considering the bones were found partially fragmented, is it possible that any of the bones were broken trying to get transported into the cave system with these large drops in the height? Sure, yeah, that's possible too. Um, most of the, the material that we've looked, well, almost all of the material that we've looked at so far, the, all the breakage appears to be after death. So, and after the material 
um, lost the soft tissue as well. There are particular ways to, to tell something, you know, whether a break happens um, before an individual dies or around the time an individual dies or sometime after the individual dies. So most of the breakage that we see in, in Homo naledi is um, after death and is usually the result of, of just sort of the bones piling up um, and a little bit of sediment pressure on them. We do have a few sort of minute fractures, actually mostly in the feet, that suggest that Homo naledi was engaged in long distance walking and that, you know, they might have had these what they call sort of stress fractures in their feet, but then that they healed up. Um, but other than that, we don't actually have any other signs of, of trauma or damage to the bones. And the question might come up, we don't have any indication of disease on the on these individuals as well. So we do have some individuals that have, you know, tooth decay, or if they've worn their teeth down, but we don't have any overt indication that of, of what they died from, whether it was a disease or, or a, you know, a trauma or an accident. Hmm. There's been some questions if you had any evidence of tools in the cave or tool usage among Homo naledi in other Yeah, areas. no no tools yet. Um, so we've we've found no no tools at all, no no debitage, so no flakes of tools, um, you know, material that gets left behind from making tools. So none of that is present in the cave. Um, there's something, you know, as I mentioned, there's something interesting in the anatomy of the Homo naledi hand that suggests that they had a very good grip um, and quite a, a strong precision grip as well. So that suggests, um, but doesn't give us, you know, good confirmation that they were they were doing something that involved good sort of precision, strong grip. Maybe that was climbing of some kind. It could even be kind of precision rock climbing. Or it could suggest that they, you know, at least had the capability to make tools, even if they weren't necessarily doing it. And we don't have any evidence for it yet. So again, lots of speculation, unfortunately, but yeah. questions to questions to pursue. So yeah. Okay. So there were a couple other questions on uh, on cave art, whether you know what kind of dating methods they would use on cave art. I guess going to the next part of your talk where you're talking about the cave art. Yep. Um, there's a, well, there's a bunch of different techniques um, that they use to date uh, cave art, depending on what it is and where it is and um, whether you're allowed to do destructive uh, testing on them, which most places um, won't allow you to do. So um, yeah, we, we are hoping with the cave art that, that we're looking at in Canada here at the moment, um, that our first step will be simply to document the, the site, and this will be in conjunction with the First Nations um, groups that are in the area so that they have some, some participation and say in what's going on, because it's, you know, it's acceptable and it's appropriate and respectful now to involve those groups. Um, so what we would like to do initially is nothing destructive, and it will simply be um, very thorough documenting using um, as many different technologies as we can. So 3D scanners, um, XRF, so X-ray sort of fluorescence to try and highlight some of the pictures. And then if, if we get permission to do something like um, dating on it, a destructive technique, then for us, probably radiocarbon dating is the most likely to be effective in this context, because we're not expecting it to be super, super old. Um, radiocarbon dating has a, a max of about 50,000 years, and we're expecting this to be younger than that. Obviously, radiocarbon dating would not have worked for Homo naledi, um, and the dating methods that we used to date Homo naledi material, um, you know, ranged from things like uranium thorium and and doing some dating methods on on both the sediments and some of the material around the bones, and then actually dating the teeth themselves. So um, that's sort of a separate question. But for the for the Paleolithic art or the the cave paintings at this point. Um, probably our best bet with the particular site is radiocarbon dating. Okay, and then another question about cave art, is cave art a marker of intellect or awareness? Oh, all these age old questions. Um, these are questions that are, are um, you know, hotly debated, um, you know, and have been for, for a long time. Obviously the, you know, the, the depiction of, um, you know, symbolic images or 
um, you know, writing, drawing a, another animal on a cave wall has to, has to involve a certain level of, of cognitive ability and, and, you know, intellectual um, thought. But, um, you know, and there's still a lot of questions as to whether things like uh, species like Neanderthals bury their dead, which also, you know, burial or treatment of the dead in a specific fashion, things like burial or, or you know, burying them with ochre or grave goods also suggests a, a higher level of thinking or some kind of um, emotional attachment to something. You know, those, those discussions are still very highly debated. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I don't know, you, you know, there's, there's, yes, we see a certain trend towards different, um, more complex behaviors. That's not to say that Neanderthals and other species might not have had the capacity and simply expressed their, their intellect in a different way. Um, you even see that in, in modern humans. We, we express, I mean, for example, burial behavior, um, goes for everything from, from leaving a body out on, you know, on the ground to decompose on its own, to building the pyramids to, to venerate the dead. And so there's a huge amount of variety, even in, in what modern humans do, we have to at least expect that there's a similar, if not equal um, amount of variety in the past as well, and that we're just not necessarily picking it up. Um, another question that just came up, is Homo naledi believed to be closer to the genus Australopithecus than Homo habilis? Well, that's a good question too. Um, the difficulty with that is partly the time. So Homo naledi being at 335,000 years is very, very recent. So since anatomically modern humans were around at the same time, Homo naledi can't be a direct ancestor because we were already around. So they're more like a, a cousin. So, you know, you have, you have living cousins and you have yourself and somewhere in the distant past, um, you have a common relative. And that's certainly what's going on with Homo naledi is that somewhere in the distant past, there is a common relative to, to humans. Um, some parts of Homo naledi's anatomy look very much like some Australopithecine features but more of their features are aligned with our own genus Homo. So, um, you know, if I were going to say, I mean, I don't want to even say definitively, but Homo naledi is, is closer, probably uh, a closer relative to us, certainly than any Australopithecine because we have grouped them in our own genus. Um, Homo habilis is considered, you know, at the very early stages of our own genus. Um, and so how, how that particular species relates to either Homo naledi or us is, I think, really, depending on who you talk to, still an open question. Mm. So uh, another question that I thought was interesting was whether there's any live footage of this cave system or a similar cave system. I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know if did you film, footage. did you do any video filming when you were in the cave? Yes. Oh, yes. There's, yep. There's probably. Or is mm, there any available publicly, I guess? Yep. Um, you can, you can search YouTube. Um, if you get on YouTube, um, you can search the Rising Star Cave. There's, there is some um, video footage of some of the cavers moving through the system. I think I'm in one of them. There's also actually a three-dimensional um, laser scan that we did that does a fly through. Um, which is quite cool. Uh, so you can see that on YouTube. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, there's, there is footage out there, um, both of the, of the cave system. Um, and if, I think we didn't really mention it, but there is a, a PBS Nova special called Dawn of Humanity. And it's a two hour special that came out in, uh, in 2015, I guess. Um, and that also actually has some, some footage of the cave and, and, us moving through the system. All right, so um, I think we, we've gone through a lot of the questions that were posted. There's one of the most recent one uh, asking whether these species that are closely related to us, whether you think they have any uh, effect on the uncanny valley effect, um, 
like our response to seeing something that's similar to us, but not similar enough, whether that causes some kind of anxiety or fight or flight uh, feelings in human beings. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's, you know, for I, I'll speak for myself. Um, I, you know, I find looking at Homo naledi and, and looking at some of these other hominins, um, the same, in a very same vein, as I look at, at extant primates, um, they are both familiar and, and not. Um, and that certainly for lots of people brings up mixed feelings. I mean, even when you see, um, you know, something like a, a dog walking on two legs, there's something in your, in the back of your head that goes, mm, is that, am I comfortable with that or not? There is something about, you know, recognizing your, something that is very similar to, to your own group. Um, but I, I find it, uh, I tend to go towards those things rather than run away from them. So maybe I wouldn't survive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's, uh, I think that that's the end of the questions that I see. So, um, okay. I think that it definitely stimulated a whole bunch of, uh, questions on lots of different topics. And I think yeah. that, that is evidence for just how fascinating this is and, and, you know, how uh, passionate you are about it and how well you presented it. So I definitely thank you, thank you for uh, joining us tonight with this uh, really fascinating topic. So you're very hopefully, welcome. Hopefully uh, you can come back after you've <laughs> answered a few more of these questions and we can see you in person. That would be, that would be amazing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay. All right. And I would like to also uh, thank all of the people attending. There are a lot of thanks being expressed in the chat as well as these questions. So a lot of people very excited, very fascinated by this talk. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I also wanted to thank all the people who are attending live. If you found this interesting and you know someone who wasn't able to attend live, this uh, will be, the recording will be posted on the Great Valley Museum YouTube site. And uh, we hope to see a lot of you in the fall in our live presentations on so that you can learn some other interesting science with us. So thank you and have a great evening and good luck on finals next week, everybody. Good luck.